Hello, welcome to my talk, Rolling Your Own Security Team for Fun and No Profit at All. We will come to that later while we are um, focusing on fun. It will be clear at the end. Um, so let's quickly go through the agenda. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we actually do as in the Arch Linux security team. Then we will a little bit look into how we got there and take a small um, look into our security tracker, which is our central platform, and then discuss um, the core of this talk, basically uh, what we have learned in our journey so far, and uh, finish everything with a small Q&A session. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Leventa Poyak, and I'm a full-stack software and security engineer and also love DevOps duties. I joined Arch Linux in 2014, um, and I'm active in a security team, packaging, development, and also DevOps. Um, I've been elected as the Arch Linux project leader in uh, 2020. Um, so let's talk about what we actually do in a security team. So basically, our main goal, our, our primary value is keeping the Arch uh, users safe. Um, this is what everything is basically about. And uh, if we think about what that means, the, the, the main interaction from a user point of view with our distro is software, installing packages, um, because that's where the software comes from. Um, and you're doing that by pulling the packages from our repositories. So. Basically, um, yeah, we, we are responsible to ensure safety for all users by taking care of uh, the safety of our packages. Uh, what we on top do is um, we also consult uh, infrastructure design choices uh, nowadays and also review some configuration related to it. Um, so this is because we also run uh, different services like the AUR and other things, um, and also um, own machines uh, that we use in the whole um, um, distro process and uh, releases. Uh, so it's also equally important to focus on our infrastructure ourselves. Um, and on top, we also coordinate information. Um, what, what that means is basically, from a user perspective, uh, you see advisories being issued from our side, um, which basically warns uh, users that there has been a certain update released that fixes some um, security-related shortcomings. Um, so we also warn about the impact of uh, such uh, problems so users are aware and can prioritize updates, for example. But also, um, we coordinate embargoed issues. Um, embargoed issues, just to summarize it shortly, if you're not uh, familiar with it, um, it's basically coordinated disclosure uh, where you have um, upfront information about the security vulnerabilities that is not yet public. It's just shared um, across various entities that can prepare updates, um, review uh, uh, the problem or the fixes that, that are related to the security issue, and also have a fixed date where this information gets public. Uh, so for example, every distro can um, in a timely manner release updates at the same time. Um, so we also coordinate that with our with our uh, uh, package maintainers. Um, yeah. So we now know what we basically do today, um, but there is a lot of evolution uh, that led us, uh, yeah, to get there where we are today. So let's have a quick look into the timeline and basically how we got here. And yeah. Um, it was a bit before 2014, but I think January 2014 is a good date to pinpoint some community efforts that were uh, that existed back then. Um, basically, community members uh, filed bug reports and issues about uh, CVs, um, which means uh, CVs are. Uh, an identifier for a specific security vulnerability, so it, 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 a certain issue can be referenced in a 
uniform way um, and easily uh, recognizable with an ID and uh, yeah, a year. Um, so the community filed bug reports and patches, uh, but there was nothing really structured. Um, we were, we we're still very thankful, uh, even up until today, that uh, our community still helps us and files bug reports. So thanks a lot there. Um, but there was some kind of demand for something established, something structural, something persistent. Um, so this led to, to um, in, in March 2014, that Ellen basically made a call for action to fund or, or to found such a security team. And yeah, have have really something established inside our distro that is um, dedicated to be responsible for this kind of things. And it um, yeah, the, the main focus that Ellen wanted to see here was our packages. Um, so this is also, as I explained earlier, basically the main interaction point from a user per perspective. And uh, this was what Ellen really was looking for. It, it took until September 2014 until um, me and Remy basically founded the security team. It was day zero, kind of. We came up with um, with well-defined workflows and structures and also templates for advisories and really wanted to send out advisories to users. Uh, things like that did not exist before. And this was basically the day zero where where this team has been founded. Um, it, it took over two years to finally come up with our own platform to coordinate all the work. Uh, so in around December 2016, uh, it was quite specifically December 2016, I still remember it, uh, because um, I made the big release uh, during uh, the CCC. Um, which is um, an annual conference at the end of the year. Um, and it helped us streamline all our work. Um, so I, I will come to that shortly and also show a little bit how it looks like, how we interact with this uh, central platform to coordinate, um, to coordinate everything which is package related. Um, so and this September, we had our sixth birthday, which I'm really proud of. Um, this was a long journey so far, and we evolved quite a lot. And I'm especially proud of it because even through Alan back then made the call for action to uh, have such a security team. Once uh, we stepped ahead and said, yeah, now is the time. We are really eager to see this happen, and we want to invest time. and. Uh, we are very passionate about it. It was kind of skeptical and said, like, in six months, we will be gone. And turns out we are still here. And, yeah, we've come to stay. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, all our efforts also led to a lot of uh, visibility and fixes and uh, improvements in our distro. So these numbers are just from our security tracker. Um, Basically, it, it is a bit higher because uh, I, I did not count everything uh, that we released and issued before our uh, central platform uh, went live. Uh, but so far, we have issued over 880 advisories and uh, we have uh, released over 1,100 packages with fixes that we tracked that had security vulnerabilities or well, after this release, they hopefully didn't have uh, those anymore. Um, the discrepancy is here a little bit because sometimes uh, we decide to not issue advisories. This is because uh, our distro is a rolling release, so we only have one version, and we expect users to kind of update in a timely manner, um, which which means if we if we want to track all fixes for every software that affects our packages. And we do so, hopefully. Um, but sometimes it takes a while or some some issues were discovered or at least made public um, 
very far in the future after a release. So, for example, if an issue was fixed for six months or something like that, and we then track and add the information to our platform, uh, we basically assume that users should have updated within six months. So we don't issue advisories if the severity of an issue is yeah, also not too critical that we say we still want to warn users after such a long period of time. So this is why this difference in the numbers exists. Um, now let's look a little bit about uh, how our um, security tracker works. And uh, you can reach it at security.archlinux.org. Uh, it, it, it helps us keep track of all the information, um, of all the issues and information related to uh, CVs and uh, certain open source software. Uh, we also use it to track um, yeah, related things like uh, uh, links, uh, uh, change logs, also uh, commits, because uh, we always try to find commits so we can easily verify certain fixes and if they uh, those fixes really made it into a release. Um, our platform also has a central to-do list, so we, we um, have a much more streamlined and easier way to find what we need to do right now, what kind of packages got updates released and things like that. Um, before our platform, before our central uh, security tracker, uh, we needed to do all this manually, which was a lot of pain. Um, yeah, a lot of pain. So we are very lucky that we now have a very well-established central platform. Um, I will show, show, uh, shortly show some um, some examples uh, how it how it looks like. Also describe a little bit uh, what what we did before we had this platform. Um, it also has or uh, it also provides an API uh, for external consumption, uh, which means just an example. The data could be pulled out of our tracker to create tools like uh, giving users the ability to correlate the data on our tracker with their local systems, which basically makes it able um, to warn users that, or make users aware that they have some packages installed which have known vulnerabilities, as well as uh, that there are updates available that fixes uh, certain issues, um, which yeah was not yet updated on a local machine for a user. Um, we the, the world tracker is also open source, so open for contribution, and uh, we are also happy, always happy if we can extend it further. Uh, so we are inviting everyone to take a look, and uh, if, if something is missing on the platform, we are happily accepting patches. Let's uh, look a little bit at how it looks like. This is basically the index, um, the, the, the main page, the front page when uh, w w that you will see when you visit our tracker. It lists all the currently open security vulnerabilities. You can also go through all the fixed ones and get also more detailed information. If, for instance, you click on one of the issues, one of the CVs, you get a very detailed overview um, including descriptions, severity, and things like that. It also has uh, cross-references, so it shows uh, what kind of packages were affected by an issue or if they were some advisories already released. Um, this is kind of handy, actually, so makes navigation and um, yeah, collecting information about certain aspects uh, very easy and uh, convenient. Uh, from our team perspective, we have a very easy to use uh, form based input uh, where we can add details to the tracker. Um, back then, this was not that easy. It was very annoying and cumbersome. I will show in two slides how it looked like. Uh, so this is a huge uh, improvement, I can really assure you. Um, we also use all this information uh, to correlate and, and uh, assemble a final advisory. 
um, set lists all the issues that uh, affected one release, uh, summarizes everything, uh, states which version is the one you need to have installed at least uh, installed to make um, to make those issues disappear and we also have a summary basically an impact um, all the issues what kind of impact do they have for a user so it's easier to understand from a user perspective without reading through a wall of text sometimes uh, what, what is the actual impact why, why should i update or um, or can i just delay it a little bit because it does not really affect me or it is not too critical so i don't need to run home and install uh, updates on all my systems or something like that um and back then we we also created this one manually so this also gave us a lot of free time we also have uh, uh, logs so audit logs where we can see diff based changes um, so it also makes the work a little bit easier because if we want to have a discussion about something, for instance, if a severity got raised to high or one of our members thinks it should really be high um, because it affects, I don't know, for example, if, if it was uh, uh, detected that is not lo just a local issue, but uh, it is a network facing issue, then you also want to, of course, erase the severity. Um, and sometimes you want to have a discussion about why some data was added in a way like it was. So this helps also to, um, to initialize such a discussion uh, and know who entered what kind of data. Um, um, yeah, this is basically how it looks or what it looked like before we had our central platform. This is a simple wiki that we used. We inserted all the entries manually. We keep track of updated packages manually. Um, we wrote all those advisories manually, which often were not really fault tolerant. And we had formatting issues and copy paste issues and stuff like that. And it also consumed a lot of time, so it was really annoying to do. And um, as you can see, uh, this, this platform really helped to streamline the whole process for us. Um, so let's a little bit talk now about what, what we have actually learned in the six years um, and uh, what, what we have learned by developing the tools we have today and why we did so and uh, stuff like that. Um, so one of the main central core values is that optimi uh, optimization is crucial. It is not something optional. You, you need to always optimize. Um, we'll talk about that very shortly. So let, let's quickly go through this list. It is basically a high level summary of what we have learned in the six years. And then we will get into detail uh, shortly after. Um, Another very important uh, aspect is having motivated people. This is also something non-optional. You really need to assure that you have motivated people that are passionate about what they're doing. Um, and if you are dealing with people, it is equally important to always be excellent to each other. Um, we will also talk about that a little bit in depth uh, in a couple of slides. Um, but you really need a healthy environment and. This is very, very important. Um, also, at, uh, yeah, you also need clear responsibilities. So think about your responsibilities and don't overextend in early stages. Um, what I mean by that, we'll come to that uh, also in a couple of slides. So now let's, let's focus on the first topic, which is optimization. Um, Often in my career, and over and over again, it happens that people, or if you if you want to improve something and you say, oh, look at this, this, you really need to improve some aspects and then you get a lot of, or a better handling of something, you get more free time, you, you don't need to do busy work and stuff like that. Uh, what busy work means, I uh, will explain also shortly, but they, they also say, they always say, they're too busy to improve, uh, which is which is the number one biggest mistake. If I, I if I would 
need to name one, in my opinion. And it is it is really a fundamental part of every tech process, or at least it should be a fundamental central part of uh, every development process. Um, at the end, you need to think about it a little bit different. There's virtually never too little work, uh, especially in the enterprise environment where you're hired to do something. There is really never a, a period of time where you say, oh, now I'm bored, now I can optimize. This is just not going to happen. You always have work. You should always do something. Um, and so if you take that into account, then the only conclusion is that optimization needs to be a fundamental core value of your whole development process. Uh, and this is really important. And if you if you look at it like that, then you will also never say that you're too busy to optimize because that's just a lie to yourself and just don't do it. It's a very huge mistake. Um, so why do we want to optimize? Um, the, the primary goal is that we want to fight busy work. A busy work means like work you're doing that has no value itself. So. Basically, you're just doing the work to achieve something different. But um, to picture it a little bit, let's say we need to dig a hole and um, you just have a shovel and no further tools. Um, and you need to, to bring uh, or to carry the sand a mile away or something. So at early stages, when you have no additional tools, you can just use your shovel and just uh, walk over a mile every time you you dig deeper um, to to yeah to carry the sand over. Uh, but this is, as you can imagine, highly inefficient. You can do that at the beginning, but um, this whole process and just walking over and and, and dropping a shovel full of sand is literally busy work because it has no value. You're just doing it to achieve your final task, which is having the sand somewhere else. So um, this is busy work. And if you want to optimize away this kind of busy work, you would, for example, come up with a, with a push cart where you could put in a lot of sand and just carry over tons of sand uh, in one move. So you reduce the busy work without losing any core values. Uh, so this is super important if you want to grow. So uh, uh, identify and eliminate your busy work uh, uh, parts. Um, but you still should always also assess your workflows. Um, there are central parts of your workflows that are that that have value itself. So you don't want to automate that. Um, what I mean by that is if we take an example in in what in the work we do in the security team. Uh, there are central parts of our workflow, for example, the verification step that has huge, huge value that you do not want to lose uh, by, by having it fully automated. Um, what I mean by that is we have a final look over um, or let's get one step back. Um, if our platform in the to-do list of our platform, there is an entry that some package got updated, which should now carry the fix uh, for a vulnerability. Uh, normally, you could automate it away and automatically send, for instance, the advisory right away and stuff like that. Um, but then you lose this core value. I, I'm about to explain this, this verification step. So we don't eliminate that part. We still verify it manually that, OK, this is really the update. Um, there was no mistake done. The commit is inside the release and things like that. Uh, so this is core value. So this is why you need to look at your workflows and only automate where you don't lose values. We, ha we had that uh, uh, several times already that some patches that needed to be backported uh, were applied uh, in, 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 un insufficiently. So basically, uh, a fully automated process wouldn't have caught it, and we would have warned about uh, about having something fixed, which in fact was still vulnerable. So this is why why some manual steps in your workflow can be good. So don't just blindly automate everything away. Um, this also has a little bit to do with peer reviewing critical uh, parts. Um, we 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 don't just manually verify it like person and then go. 
Um, but we we try to always peer review all the things at least by two persons or more. Um, this helps to catch errors that or or fail or, or just overlooked stuff. Um, sometimes it happens. We are all humans. Errors can happen, and we should think about a process uh, where we can reduce the amount of errors that could potentially happen. And peer reviewing is a really great thing to do. Um, it also helps cross, cross uh, a knowledge share, and um, this is also very healthy for your whole process. Um, it is also very important to document everything. So write everything down in a wiki, in a Kanban board, or something like that. Even if you don't have time right now to solve all the optimization steps you have come up with, it is still important to document everything. Um, of course, as we have talked about it, um, optimization is a fundamental part of your workflow. So by documenting the results of your thoughts, of your analysis, you, you already did a specific part of this job. And by documenting it, you ensure that you can just pick it up and solve it later when, when you have, you are able to, to uh, pick up this part of your optimization and, and solve it. Um, so even if you don't have time for it right now, you should always document it. This is a good thing. Um, so this is, it about optimization, we can now a little bit switch over to to the human part, to, to motivation. Motivation is the key to success, um, basically for everything and also for, for running a, a team, a fresh team. Motivation is one of the most important things. Um, there are different kinds of motivation uh, that that we want to, to talk about a little bit. Uh, there is in, uh, intrinsic motivation and there is also extrinsic motivation. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, and, and you can, if you're interested in that topic, you can just look up information in the internet. There is tons of information about, about motivation. Um, intrinsic motivation, uh, to summarize it roughly, is um, if you're passionate about something, if, if the motivation comes from within yourself from from some some values some 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 ideas you have really it, it boils down to having passion and and um, being self-motivated uh, and contrary to that extrinsic motivation is just that there are some goals you want to achieve and everything else is just yeah you're not passionate about the thing itself but about the goal you want to reach uh, for example, in a corporate environment, that would be getting a salary raise or having a title or something like that. The problem with that is that it always needs reinforcement. Shortly after you get a salary raise, this isn't enough anymore. And at one point, you want to have another dose of motivation, and then you need another salary raise. So what you really want to find is intrinsically motivated people, because they're passionate about the work and they will do everything to improve it. And um, this is extremely healthy for a team. So it is very tough to identify intrinsically motivated people, but is a key component uh, if you want to have a healthy and um, passionate team. Um, it is equally important to maintain motivation. So just being motivated at the beginning is not enough. You need to maintain the motivation. You need to, to keep being motivated. Um, there are different ways to achieve it. It is also a very personal thing because intrinsic motivation is personal. Um, but you want to give utilities to people that they are able to maintain motivation. Uh, we come to that shortly when we talk a little bit about identifying uh, responsibilities and things like that. Um, but all that also boils down, um, or, or at least motivation is part of that, um, that, that you need to, to make sure that you're not burning out or any single one of your team members is burning out. There are different ways uh, how you could burn out. Um, in a startup phase, and this is totally fine. It is also beneficial if you want to start establishing something that you work like, let's say, 200%. Um, but this, this can't be sustained for a, 
extended period of time, you will burn out. So you need to identify that in time and 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 reduce the the, the problematic parts that would lead to burnout. Uh, just an example about myself at the early stages, I had some scripts running to identify package updates. And basically, I had an alarm clock or, or some kind of ring that would appear in the middle of the night when some new updates were released. So I could wake up and just enter the data in the wiki. And it was really cool. I was really passionate about doing it, about getting the information out to the users as fast as possible. Um, and it was also, I believe, healthy for for the startup phase. But uh, you can imagine this is not something you want to do forever. This is not cool. And you need to identify it and then just just, just solve it in a different way, which which yeah, which avoids people burning out. This is extremely important. Um, if we are talking about people, Another important topic is communication. Uh, so you always want to ensure that you have a friendly and respectful uh, environment and communication. Um, the key here is nonviolent communication, and you want to have a healthy environment that ensures it. This is also a very huge topic. You can also lock up nonviolent communication. Um, but if we want to summarize it in very small bullet points, I would say just there, everyone has basically needs and, and you want to solve something and, but you may have different point of views or different things you want to solve as your need. Um, the, the, the problem is we are all humans and I believe nobody really wants to, to fight over something or be disrespectful to something. This is just something that happens. Um, and you need to take that into account, especially if you're dealing with uh, text and not voice or personal uh, discussions, then you're also reducing some side channels. So what I mean by that is you don't have emotional layer. You, you can't see the expression of the other person. You also don't have maybe the voice you can use to, to, to hear out that something is meant in a joking way or something like that. If you have only text, this, this increases the likelihood for misinterpretation. Uh, you, an easy thing is just just look at everything that people don't want or people are not evil minded. People try to just get their point straight. Um, so you should keep that in mind and don't assume people are disrespectful or something. And contrary to that, if you write some text or you communicate with someone in some different ways, always try to do it in a way that assures it could not be easily misinterpreted um, and maintain a healthy environment. This is super important. Um, it is also important to be approachable. What I mean by that is uh, this also correlates a little bit with visibility and with being friendly and having a healthy and nonviolent uh, and uh, communication environment. Um, you establish by that a little bit that you don't always need to run around and see where you need to poke into. Uh, I mean, to some degree, you want to do that, but you will also want people to know that they can approach you and they can actively consult you when they have some new topics that should be discussed. So be approachable. This, this also means have clear communication channels, like select one primary communication channel, whatever that is. Uh, for us personally, it is IRC, but I'm pretty sure this wouldn't work out for other people. So just find for your environment and for your team what is an appropriate communication channel and stick to that and make it clear um, how, how you can be reached. Uh, this is very important also to a little bit implement a security centric mindset into different teams uh, that they themselves take it a little bit more into account or at least come over to you and consult you in certain aspects. Um, it is also super important to be self-aware. Um, what I mean by that is, and especially that applies for uh, security, but also for everything else, um, it's totally okay to not know everything. Not everyone can know everything. This is literally impossible. 
but the problem is if 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 you don't respect your your boundaries where knowledge about topic starts to get blurry then this is very destructive for security and also for general tech related topics or in general for everything basically um of course if you start pretending even through you should be aware that this area starts to blur out at this point now um then this 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 leads to to problems to to um overlooked security implications or something like that um you want to be aware of it and then take the steps to either consult further persons who may have more knowledge in a certain topic or at the very least uh, educate yourself uh, further so you can make an yeah, an, an educated um, um, response to something uh, this is super important so so always be self-aware it's totally okay to not know everything um, one thing you also should uh, think about are responsibilities. So define your core values. Uh, think, think, especially at the early stages, don't try to solve everything that you come up with. Just think about what is the core value, what is the core problem you try to solve uh, with, with yeah, introducing a new team. Uh, for instance, when we, we have uh, uh, when we founded the security team, the core value was uh, packages, um, and also very in a very limited way. Um, so basically, yeah, basically just keeping track of CVEs and uh, uh, upst upstream fixes and applying those. Um, but but you can extend it. We come to that uh, very shortly. Uh, it, but if you if you have your core values, the reason for that is that you want to avoid oversaturation. The problem is, in the early stage, let's say when we are only two people, the problem is if you want to solve everything right away and also take care of infrastructure and everything you can imagine, then you just don't have enough time to solve all the tasks and you will miss some task or work gets delayed or updates get delayed or advisory uh, or issuing advisories get delayed this is why you don't want to oversaturate yourself um, think about the core values and extend them later and stick to them until you feel confident that now you can uh, add more um areas to your responsibilities uh, before you're in sh before you're sure that you won't delay the work you're currently focusing on um, yet yeah, just don't add more responsibilities uh, it is also important to uh, at, at that step to to explore further areas um, you you can do that by even either getting more team members but just throwing more people onto it is not not it is also not sustainable on a long shot um you you want to extend your team but still while optimizing every single point of your workflow and tooling over and over and over again otherwise you are highly inefficient and you're just doing lots of busy work and you just throw more and more people onto it which creates other kind of problems if you then end up with having 30 people doing busy work this just don't do it uh, explore further areas when you get free time by optimizing or by getting one two new members into your team and always think outside the box so look around you uh, in, in for certain topics or areas what I mean by that is all directions basically mean if we think about packages that we talked about, um, look a layer below and a layer above. If, if Let's say if we want to look a little bit further away, a layer above it, then w what does packages mean? A, a package is not just or not always just an upstream source. It can have additional content. Basically, for instance, a systemd unit file, uh, which describes the service and this can contain for instance um, information what user should run the service or what kind of additional hardening uh, this unit uh, activates or configures uh, so 
A layer above could be hardening those unit files. Don't run services as root and you don't require um, restrict further down capabilities uh, and, and um, other hardening ways. Um, this is a layer above. We want to think about a layer below. A package, what does a package mean if, you, we, if we look deeper into it? For instance, it could be a binary, a C, C++ binary or something, which is compiled. And what does that mean? If we compile code, then we also have compiler flags and linker flags. This, this could be also a way of hardening your packages and, and revisiting the new, um, new compiler flags that you can use, uh, uh, like uh, Pi or other kind of things. Um, so, so just al always look around and think outside the box, uh, but, but not just for one area. If you also want to explore new areas, so, so look at the left and right of you. Uh, what I mean by that is go away from packages if you have enough time and think about new topics like infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is a totally new area you want to grow into, and this is what we did when we gained uh, more, more, yeah, more free time that we could then invest in new work. Um, so always be clear and explore your responsibilities when it's appropriate. Uh, taking or speaking about responsibilities. The current team, this is uh, who is responsible for all that that I described, um, are our six core members here. And at that point, I want to to yeah to send special thanks to every single one of uh, of our team members. And um, I'm really proud to have such a great team. And to to I'm really lucky that that we managed to have such a nice team. You can really rely on every single one of uh, the team members and everyone is really passionate about the work they're doing. And thanks again. So if you see any one of those at a conference or something like that, send them some cheers or buy them some drinks, beer, a mate, something they like. Uh, so yeah, this is, give something back to them. They, they rock. Yeah. Um, now let's a little bit summarize what we have learned uh, so far uh, about everything we have talked about in, in this uh, slide so far. So it's a summary, and you, you, I, I guess you could have you, you see how passionately I also talked about my team and how proud I am. Um, this is uh, also because. They're intrinsically motivated. They're really passionate about their work, their work. And this is one of the key learnings. Try to find intrinsically motivated people who are really passionate about their work. It's a lot cooler to work with people like that. And um, it is also a lot healthier and it makes things easier to expand further areas and to evolve into something bigger and something better. Uh, so try to find cool people. Um, another important factor is optimization. Optimization is not optional. And don't say you don't have time for optimization, then you're doing something wrong. Always have time for optimization. It is super important. Um, otherwise, you will spiral down in a tech debt state, which is very tough to get out. Um, and the further down you, you, you go, the tougher it gets to get out of it. So just, just don't. Just don't. Always optimize. Plan in enough optimization time into your process. Uh, depending, depending on areas, it, it could a little bit differ, but be clear how much time you always invest in optimization. Um, and maintain a nonviolent communication environment. Uh, be friendly. Be, be excellent to each other. And uh, if you see things can easily get heated, especially if you uh, or yeah, especially if you're dealing only with text. Uh, take that into account and try to de-escalate things. And we're all just humans and we all just, yeah, we don't want to fight each other. This, this is really not something we should do at all. We should be friendly to each other. We, we should spread love. And this, this is also especially important for, 
for teams, for internal and external communication, be super friendly, then people will also like to approach you from their own. And you don't need to run around and search where you need to get involved because um, people like then to talk to you and to communicate uh, with you. And always try to also de-escalate yourself and revisit a uh, discussion. I also had it several times myself that I noticed that at one point I just misunderstood something or things like that. And at the end, it turned out that this shouldn't even have been felt like it needs to go in some kind of heated way because it was just a miscommunication and and and, and try to to step back and look again at the information and and try to to bring it into a way which is friendly and this helps a lot um, also define uh, responsibilities. Think about the core responsibilities of yours and stick to them. And when you optimize uh, your processes, your toolings, and you get um, you get a little bit of uh, yeah freedom to to be able to extend the responsibilities, then think about or then um, you can think about it earlier um, and documented, but then only start to implement or, or make new responsibilities to your core values if you have really the freedom to do it appropriately. What I mean by that is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, where you're sure that other work you already have as core responsibilities don't get delayed. It's super important. It's better to focus on something which you do appropriately than focusing on everything you can imagine and lose this yeah lose the, the the value itself because you can't sufficiently do the work anymore because it's just too much so at that point i want to thank everyone for listening to my talk i hope um i i could get my points uh, uh, um, over to you and uh, if you have any questions then feel free to ask them um, I also invite you to to come around and uh, chat with our team and maybe get a, a involved in this different aspects uh, of our distro security. We also we always very we are very welcoming uh, for everyone in our community. And at the end, this every 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 part of this is a community effort. So uh, yeah, come around and yeah, think about how you can get involved if you wish to. Yeah. So if you want to contact us, here are some um, contact information. Thanks a lot. Uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. All right. Welcome to the last Q&A of the day. And uh, my name is Makilanu. Uh, or my name is Marcus and I go by Michelanu and I have no other than Anthrax with me um, and we are to do some Q&A. So let's just dive into it. Um, has Arch considered becoming a CVE numbering authority? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, so far, we just did not uh, apply for it. So I hopefully we will fix that uh, pretty soon because we sometimes uh, have um, yeah, cases where we should get some CV numbers ourselves. Um, so this would aid a little bit the process of ours. Right, sounds great. And that, that question was by Fox Boron, by the way. Um, next question by Tams. Um, do the arts maintainers ever manually re uh, review code? Is security a factor in deciding whether to package some software? Um, I guess partially it's up to the maintainers, but at the end, um, there is sometimes dead software, which is basically unmaintained upstreams and things like that. Um, so we try to identify it and uh, see if we can get rid of it. Sometimes it's challenging because you also have lots of uh, dependencies and yeah, but, um, we at least try to have an eye on it and get get rid of it if it's really unmaintained and has a lot of vulnerabilities. Right, sounds great. Um, how do closed source proprietary packages in the community uh, repository work? Uh, for example, Discord. Um, are there any special 
procedures with respect to security, trust, distribution for these packages? Um, I wouldn't say there is a very strict guideline about that, but uh, first it boils down to us or being allowed to re redistribute something like that. It depends a little bit also on the license of such projects uh, and on maybe if we get an allowance to do so, which, which we always are very keen to ensure that this is the case. Um, on top of that, when it comes to, to trust and security, uh, this is a tough question, um, especially because I think open source is extremely important. So it's always like, uh, why is the source not open? This is not good. Um, but yeah, it, I, it boils down a little bit to if this, how widespread is the software and things like that. So right. I, I don't think it would make sense to just yeah, package everything. Yes. Um... And the next question is by the same guy as the last uh, question, Daniel R. Parks. Um, what does it take for a proprietary package to get included in the official repo repos? Uh, well, as mentioned, basically it boils down to uh, licensing if we are allowed to or we have an allowance to do so. Um, and yeah, just have some sanity checks on if we really want to package proprietary software and um, is it really an established software in terms of, is it widespread? So this at least gives some indications about if it's trustworthy or not. Also, you can vote on your packages, right? To, uh, to get them accepted and stuff like that. Um... Next question by U1106. Is there a fixed rule when no ASA is done? You mentioned uh, six months, but that sounded a bit like an example. It was quite literally an example. We, we don't have very strict rules about that. Mostly if, if something just takes very, very long time. And as mentioned, the severity is not too critical that we still want to make sure to warn people about it. Uh, we, we mo I, I guess we always have a small discussion about it. Like, uh, look, this package is fixed for long time. So we let's not issue an advisory or something. So there is no strict rule. We basically decide case by case. Yes. Um... Next question by Oak. Um, what software do you use for the security tracking workflow? Uh, and by workflow there, it means the security tracking and finding and patching. Um, for tracking itself, we now have, have our central platform, but um, this right now, at least, just a part of the whole workflow because we also need the information to be pulled out somewhere. Um, like NIST or Mitra or something like that. Um, right now, this is one case where we are right now optimizing in and having it more streamlined, better integrated. Uh, currently, it's more like uh, security team members are responsible to, um, yeah, to, to fetch themselves the information, get updated about uh, new CVs and uh, um, and uh, all the information and uh, append it to our platform, our security tracker. Um, but we have identified this. This is the current pain point of our wo wo workflow. So we are right now started uh, to basically get it addressed and uh, have automatically pulling in data from various sources. Um, yeah, I think. That hopefully answers the question. Yes. Um, next question by Alcazar seventy nine. Is it part of this? Is it part of the security team uh, team's mandate to verify the security fixes, or is that an individual package maintainer's responsibility? Uh, well, I, I pretty much hope that the package maintainers themselves also validate it, but it, it also depends on what what means validating. Um, a package maintainer ensures, for example, some patches get applied or something. Uh, but as mentioned also on slide 14, I think, um, we still have a verification process that we really try to ensure, um, I mean, we as security team, that we really try to assure that certain patches, certain fixes uh, were backported into a package. Because sometimes errors can happen and patches not 
properly ap uh, applied or something like that. Um, so we try to always have an eye on it and verify that it indeed got fixed. Uh, sometimes there are cases when we have some uh, reproducers that we also throw those against a uh, fixed version and see if we can still trigger something. Um, so yeah, we do it manually. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, next question by uh, Hoyt. Uh, does Arch Linux have any paid staff? If yes, how many? And where does that money come from? Uh, no, not at all. So basically, we're all volunteers. Um, this free time for every one of us. Um, yeah, so we don't have any paid staff. Um, but yeah, our income is basically uh, from donations. Uh, yeah. Yes. So if you like our project, please donate. Go get some merch. They. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the next question by Arch Guest um, concerning Arch infrastructures, uh, mirrors, archlinux.org, etc. How is the security handled in there? Pen tests, uh, vuln, vuln assignment. Um, well, there are different aspects, and this is an area we uh, are shortly now, um, or since uh, since a little bit. Uh, already involved there and we um well basically there's some stuff that the devops team itself is also doing like uh, um monitoring uh, known issues that uh, are affected by packages we have installed on our own infra uh, which is by pulling out the data of our security trackers uh, and and do timely uh, updates on that uh, we also actively say like oh we need to um, update our machines because like, for instance, some nasty kernel issue got fixed or something else. Um, on top of that, we also uh, review uh, infrastructure related things. Um, but this is a little bit like uh, where basically the work of the DevOps team and the work of the security team is overlapping. Uh, so it is also a responsibility of the DevOps uh, team, but we of course help to um, to try to review configuration, try to review uh, design choices, and uh, also um, actively try to to find vulnerabilities in uh, um, in our servers. Um, so yeah, right. Um, so the next question is from several people: uh, Diabonas, uh, Griel, and others. Um, how can you get involved with uh, in the Arch Linux security team? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think at the last slide of mine, um, I've shown some channels where you can get in touch with us, uh, most notably the IRC uh, at uh, uh, hashtag ArchLinux uh, uh, minus um, security, uh, where we are basically always hanging around. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is finding finding CVEs or known vulnerabilities that we did not uh, track in our tracker yet. Um, also maybe try to um, review something. We basically always post our advisories beforehand. Um, so this could also be something just looking over it. If the data inside it is uh, uh, looks good, if um, the patches we mention are the, the ones uh, that really affect this, uh, uh, this problem. Um, and also sometimes filing bugs to our package uh, maintainers uh, to get some stuff sorted out. Um, so I think it's easier just dropping by in the IRC and uh, trying to find information that we don't already track. This would yeah. be a first good first entry point. Yeah, the IRC is a great start to great place to start. Um, so the next question by archconf fifty three. Um, can you talk a bit more about the API for the security tracker? Um, where is it? Is it publicly available or only for, for the security team internally? Uh, no, it's publicly available. I guess we could optimize um, having a proper documentation on it because I think we know we basically lack proper API documentation. Um, but what you can do is uh, either append slash JSON or uh, dot JSON to basically all the endpoints. Like if you open the index page or 
like you open a CVE entry and you just add uh, a dot JSON at the end, uh, then you get everything in JSON formatted way, uh, which should be very easy uh, to write to to consume the data. Um, but this is also something we have documented in our issues. Uh, we really should um, have proper API documentation, which we currently lack, unfortunately. Yes. Um... So the next question is from uh, Codin Alt, um, and that's basically how how you identify burnout. Um. Uh, I guess that's a super tough question, and that could be a whole talk on its own. Uh, I also wouldn't say like I'm an expert in identifying burnout or something, because it's also very a very personal thing. Mostly, it it, it also depends on a little bit. Uh, what 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 kind of work or what kind of part of a workflow starts to frustrate a person? This 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 could vary a little bit. Of course, there are things which is common, like oversaturation, which I also talked about, which you always want to avoid. Uh, if people are highly oversaturated, this will definitely lead to burnout. Um, but it's very tough to identify. I mean, if, if, if people are highly oversaturated, they either can recognize that themselves or sometimes people can also from the outside recognize it and try to make people aware of that and help them in some ways. Um, but mostly if it's not very obvious, it's very personal. And I think this is a point where every, every single one of us need to work on that ourselves uh, because we burn out. It's it's mostly personal things that we are annoyed about. Uh, so we should ourselves somehow create awareness of what leads to burnout in our case. Right. So the last question is from uh, Inikitenko. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, what are typical vulner uh, vulnerabilities? Uh, and what are the sources? Uh, new users or everyone? Um, so typical vulnerabilities could be, for instance, uh, denial of service uh, uh, problems in applications, uh, which basically means if you can crash the application or make it uh, uh, misbehave or something, which makes it basically unusable, um, this would be one example, or more several things like uh, remote code execution, which means if you have a service or something like that, which is network facing, then sending some specially crafted uh, content to a service uh, can uh, lead to basically giving the attacker the control to execute custom code. And by that, they can take over the system and uh, yeah, exfiltrate data and stuff like that. Um, these are some vulnerabilities. There's a lot of different uh, classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, mostly, I would say they affect all users uh, if they're inside a package or something. Um, but uh, it, it could also be that it only affects old users and not new users, for example, if uh, a fix was applied to a package. Uh, because, for instance, uh, um, directory uh, mode or um, something like that, then it may be that the package, when you update it, uh, it, it does not get the new modes applied. Um, so this could be one example, but that this is, or this, sh this should be a shortcoming in uh, the package update itself. So basically it should heal itself, especially when it's um, security related. Uh, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah, so that wraps up uh, this Q&A. Uh, thank you for answering the questions. Sure, very welcome. <laughs>